are back. Thanks for hanging out with us on this Tuesday, just two days uh, ahead of Thanksgiving. Uh, just to uh, wrap things up, Rob Domofsky, who covers the Packers for ESPN and joining us now, uh, covers everything, you name it, across the board for the Philadelphia Inquirer. You can hear him on WIP on the weekends with Glenn Macdow as well. And you can follow him on Twitter at Mike Sealski. Michael, what's going on, my man? How you making out? Hey, Rob. Hey, guys. Good to be with you as what's usual. What's going on, brother? Mike, good to see you as always, man. I, I want to jump around, but I do want to start with the Eagles with you here. Um, they win an ugly one, right, for sure. But it was a game that I think in a lot of ways you, you could extract a lot of positives here and glean a lot of positives where the quarterback comes up big when you need him most. A defense that was maligned, rightfully so, after the Washington game. After that first drive, really cl- put the clamps, uh, especially on the run game, the whole blueprint thing maybe went out the window. We'll see going forward. What were your impressions of the way that game went? Yeah, that. I mean, look, they they needed to clean up some stuff. They made a few too many mistakes, turnovers. Um, took them a while to get going offensively, obviously. But I think, like you said, Rob, I think it was encouraging to see what the defense did uh, after that initial drive where Jonathan Taylor kind of ran all over them. Uh, they really clamped down. You know, the the additions of Indomitian and Sue and Linval Joseph helped a lot. I thought uh, even though those guys didn't go on, get on the field for a ton of snaps, they were really effective when they did. I think they'll be better for Jordan Davis coming back and having those guys already on the roster uh, increases the rotation, all of that. And look, you're going to have games like this, right? You're just going to have games where you got to go on the road and you got to just grind it out and get a couple of big plays from your quarterback. And that's what they got. And that's how they won. And that's okay. How surprised were you they were able to go out and get not one but two big bodies to fill that gap in the uh, defensive trenches in a short amount of time? Well, it doesn't surprise me too much, Gunner, only because Howie Roseman is always going to be aggressive at any opportunity he gets. It was interesting. After the game, he stood outside the visiting locker room at Lucas Oil Stadium and either fist-pounded or high-fived every player and coach who came into that locker room. Now he usually does that inside the locker room, but for whatever reason, Mm -hmm. he did it outside the locker room. It's just an interesting sight. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was a reminder that, oh yeah, there's Howie Roseman. And he had a big week where he signed (laughs) two players who helped them win this game, who had seven tackles and a sack between them. So I thought that was very interesting, but look, that's what Howie does. So to answer your question, it doesn't surprise me that he doubled up like that. You had two guys at defensive tackle who can help and in their first game together did help. Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot. Now do they have enough? Super Bowl, a bust. Uh, do they have enough? I, I think they do, Barrett. I think they can get there. Uh, doesn't mean they will, but they can. And look, the way the NFL is structured and set up now it's, it's kind of like baseball in this regard, more and more. It's like who gets hot at the right time. We saw it last year with the Rams and the Bengals, uh, and I think the same kind of principle holds true here. Could the Eagles make it to the Super Bowl? They absolutely can, especially if Hurts keeps playing like this. Uh, will they? I don't know. I mean, if you get the 49ers in Lincoln Financial Field, that's a team that can, can beat you up you know, defensively and on the ground and can score in multiple ways. So that would just be one team that could present some problems for them. So uh, no guarantees. It's not like 2004 where they would go in as the clear cut favorite to see them lose would be shocking. That's not the situation this year. Mike, I, I, when it comes to the defense and, and mind you, they, you know, they certainly laid a dud against Washington, but for the most part, if you look at the critical numbers, they're good. Yet, the style seems to be more of an issue for fans over the substance of actually what's going on. Is it just people were weaned on Buddy and Jim Johnson and Bud Carson and a style versus ultimately what matters in the in the big picture? I, I, where are you generally with Gannon, I guess? You kind of hit both there. Yeah, to, to the first part of your question, Rob, I do think that's a big factor. I think... People who are fans of football in this region want to see aggressive defense. They grew up on, even if you're not old enough for the Buddy Ryan era, you were old enough for the Jim Johnson era, where Brian Dawkins 
was like a heat seeking missile out there and was coming on blitzes and nobody knew where he was going to be. And Hugh Douglas was rushing from the edge and you had stout interior linemen like Corey Simon and you had a, you know, fire breathing linebacker like Jeremiah Trotter. The Eagles team doesn't play that way. They are much more about, as you guys know, not giving up the big play. They don't want to take mm -hmm. chances. Uh, so is it frustrating for a generation of fans to see a style of play like this? Yeah, it probably is. But it's working. I mean, I was skeptical of Gannon early on, especially after that first game of the season when they gave up all those mm -hmm. points to the Lions. But the defense has been really good for the most part, with the exception of that Washington game. And now that you've got these other quote-unquote toys to play with, if you're Gannon and Sue and Joseph, you should be able to get more creative and, and kind of create more opportunities for the defense to be aggressive. Well, looking at Mike, it, um, I don't know. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I don't know if you've written a story, but I think a great storyline that we've touched on a couple of times, but I haven't heard a lot of people pick up on it is you look at Miles Sanders, Sanders being the accomplished runner that he is, but why has he been neglected in the passing game? You look at his numbers from his rookie year compared to what his numbers are since then, and I don't know if it's Miles has lost confidence in his catching ability or if the organization has lost confidence in that aspect. But that has been perplexing to me when you have a guy that multi-talented that he has it more multifaceted in the offensive flow. That's a good question, Gunner. I wonder if it has something to do with the nature of the Eagles' offense under Hertz, that because it's so much more, uh, you know, run-pass option and RPO-oriented that it's, it might take miles out of the passing game a little bit. I haven't asked about that. Uh, you, you go back early in his career and Sanders was with Carson Wentz and Nick Foles a little yeah. bit. I get uh, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong about that, but Carson definitely. Yeah, yeah, Carson definitely. Carson didn't like that style of offense. So mm -hmm. maybe it's simply that uh, that, you know, there aren't the opportunities there because the offense is set up to go to other places. And let's be honest here, too. You know, they were using Sanders more as a pass catcher a couple of years ago because they didn't have A.J. Brown and Devontae right. Smith. Right. And a healthy Dallas Goddard, who obviously they don't have now, and and even Zach Pascal. I mean, they're so much deeper outside this season than they were in the last few years that maybe that has something to do with it as well. Mm. Mike, do you put any stock in the they figured out the RPO in the Eagles offense? You know, a la Chip Kelly lights the world on fire, and then we see what happens. There, there have been other trends: the run and shoot, wildcat, whatever. Do you feel like we're we're at that point, or is that taking it a little bit too far? I think that's taken it a little too far, Rob, uh, if only because you saw what Hertz could do against the Colts. Uh, and he can do that to any team. You know, we we went through this phase early in the season where everyone was concerned about how much Hertz was carrying the ball. He's on pace to, to shatter the NFL single season record for carries by a quarterback. And then they went three weeks or so where he didn't carry the ball as much. And then they got back to it against the Colts because that's what they could use to move the ball. And that's what Jalen needed to do to get them to move the ball. So that threat is still there and it's still a very effective threat. If only because it can be so demoralizing to a defense, I think, you know, that you, he can scramble with, he just drops back. He can carry the ball himself. Look at that fourth and two play. Oh. Uh, there aren't that, there aren't many quarterbacks who make that cut in those circumstances, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, that Hurts did. I mean, most guys just run right into the line, and he, he sidesteps the, the pile and gets two and a half yards when they needed two. Uh, it's really a, a terrific play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you look at it, though, I'm, I'm looking at how this office is being run and everything, but can it – how much longer can we go without having Dallas Goddard? We'll see. That's a good question, Barrett. Uh, I mean, he brings a dimension to the offense that – you know, very few tight ends can bring to any offense. You're looking at Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, maybe one or two other guys, and Goddard. He's he's a top five tight end in this league. Uh, they, the offense absolutely misses something without him. Uh, do you see more of Zach Paschal as we go forward? Uh, more of Quez Watkins, who caught a touchdown pass Sunday. Uh, maybe they change some things up. You know, you put Jack Stoll out there, and maybe he can do just enough that if you lean a little bit more on guys like Watkins and Pascal, you can keep the offense rolling in a way that, that we were accustomed to earlier this season. Mm. Mike, how unique is what we're seeing here from Howie Roseman? You know, we talk about him being willing this past week to bring in not one, but two guys. 
uh, with the moves he made in the offseason. This team's nine and one. All the, the the trials and tribulations that he's gone through. I, I can't think of any executive that there that's even a comp here. I, I mean, this is we're in some rarefied air here with him. Yeah, certainly in Eagles history we are, yeah. and and probably in Philadelphia history. The more you think about it, Rob, I think what's interesting about Howie and who he's become kind of not only in the landscape of Philadelphia, but in the NFL as a whole is, you know, the Rams, for instance, get a lot of credit for saying, or, or blame, depending on how you want to look at it for saying, you know what, draft picks don't matter. We're going to go out and sign top end talent and we're going to try to win that way. Mm -hmm. And maybe it'll catch up to them. It looks like it might be this year, Yeah, but they got a Super Bowl out of it and they could, there were other opportunities where they could have won one. What, what Howie's done, it seems to me, has, has turned the entire regular season into an opportunity to improve your team. He's made that much more mainstream in the NFL. The idea used to be, it seemed to me, that the team you had at the beginning of the season was the team you went to battle with for all 16 or 17 weeks. And Howie's kind of thrown that out the window out of the last five years. I mean, think about how important Jay Ajayi was in 2017. Think about their move to get Golden Tate in 2018. Think about the signings, as we talked about, of Joseph and Sue here. Uh, he's turned the trade deadline and the entire regular season into an opportunity to improve the Eagles in a way that other teams hadn't tried, I feel like, in the past. And mm -hmm. um, that's interesting to me uh, because I think it fits with where the league is as a whole. It really is a year-to-year -year league now. You know, we, I thought the Eagles were going to be – really in bad shape for a long time after the whole Wentz thing went bad because they invested so much in him. But here we are two years later and they are back on top of the conference. Now, some of that is they were fortunate to draft Jalen Hurts, which is kind of, I mean, you want to play that mental game of like, if they don't draft Hurts, then they keep Wentz and they'd be worse off. But was it a mistake to draft Hurts because it ticked Wentz off? Like we can go round and round about that for days. But the fact is that they're back on top of the NFC Two years after everybody thought they were they were going to be done for for five or six years. Mm -hmm. What's well, the gold standard? The gold standard. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how we get back. But um, you think there'll be any interest in uh, trying to hype that running game up a little bit with Melvin Gordon? Well, look, I mean, they're going to have to try to, you know, look, are, are they going to go out and get Melvin Gordon? I don't know. Um, you know, you've got Hurts. You've got to consider Hurts a running back. Sanders is having the best season of his career. Uh, Boston Scott is a good second or third back. I'm not in love with Kenny Gainwell. I think he's been underwhelming. I, I would like to know why they think on third down that suddenly Kenny Gainwell morphs into Walter Payton. That stretch was weird, Mike. That yeah, whole stretch yeah. was weird. Yeah. Exactly. When Sanders disappears, he's trying to draw them off after the two-minute warning, uses a timeout. That was Bizarre. <laughs> I, I'd like to look at the, the numbers on this, guys, but it seems like Kenny Gainwell gets the ball more on third down than any back the Eagles have, and I just I don't get it. Um, but could they go get Melvin Gordon? I suppose they could have, but Barry, you don't want to tinker too much, right? Right? You know, the, the good part, and, and both Joseph and Sue said this after Sunday's game, they're not being asked to do too much right now. It's just get upfield, fill gaps, do what you've always done, play freely. You know, with a running back, it's a little different. You have to get him into a rhythm. It's harder to just put him in there for a play and take him back out again. Um, you know, it'd be different if they had signed Gordon, I think, at the beginning of the year, acquired Gordon at the beginning of the year. I would be surprised if they went out and added him now. Hey, Mike, um, Eagles have seven games left. Give me a storyline, whether it's an individual or a team concept, that, that you're looking to see if it unfolds or, or develops into something that you will pounce on uh, down the road? Well, a couple of things come to mind, Gunner. Um, one is the offensive line. I, mm -hmm. I think that they have to stay healthy. Those five mm -hmm. guys, as deep as that line is, uh, I think that is such the strength of this team, and it allows them to do so much of what they want to do offensively. You know, whether you're talking about Kelsey and his intelligence, whether you're talking about uh, Lane Johnson at right tackle and being able to block pass rushers, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about Jordan Maialato on the left side and cleaning up some of the penalties he's committed in recent weeks and, and playing, you know, getting sharper. The line is the key to everything. And if they lose one of those guys, that would be crippling, I think. Um, so that's one thing. I'm also looking to see, as we talked about earlier, 
can they work and get more out of, or at least keep fresh, guys like Quez Watkins and Zach Paschal? Because those mm-hmm. are the kind of guys later in a season, you're going to need them, okay? Tories go back to 2017. Tory Smith did not by any stretch of the imagination have a great regular season That's right. in 2017. He dropped a number of passes. But A, he was a good locker room guy, you know, smart, good teammate, all those things. And then come the postseason, he had a terrific three games yep. in, the, in the divisional round, the NFC Championship, and the Super Bowl. He was really good. So you, he didn't need to have a great regular season to be a contributor when it mattered most. And I want to see if Watkins and Pascal, because there is talent there, mm-hmm. and they have shown flashes, you know, Quez's fumble against the, the commanders notwithstanding. Those are guys who can be big contributors, and I want to see how they, you know, if they just disappear from the offense or if they kind of show that they can be part of something bigger when the games start to really matter. Hmm. Mike, I, I want to, like I said, I want to jump around a little bit. Um, I, For me, like, there's very little juice here, and I never thought I'd be saying this, but because of the Sixers' injuries, it's taken a lot of bite out of the Simmons' return. You feeling the same way, and how do you think it's going to go down tonight? Well, I'm juiced now that uh, Ben and Howard Eskin have They're apparently buddies. made amends yeah, and are buddies now. Yeah. now. W- now were you I, there this morning? I, I was not, um, uh, but I was heart- I was heartened to see that. It restored my faith in humanity. I knew you were uh, upset uh, about that. I'm glad you're okay. Um, yeah. Look, you're right, Rob. It doesn't have the juice because it's not Embiid uh, against Simmons. It's not Embiid and Harden against Simmons. Uh, and Ben, I guess to his credit has been saying kind of all the right things in the last 48 hours yeah. in talking about this, but I still think it's going to be pretty hostile down at the Wells oh, Fargo sure. center sure. tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I mean the other dimension too, is that it's Kyrie Irving's second game back since, you right. know, all the controversy around him regarding the, uh, the anti-Semitic video that he reposted. So it'll be an interesting night down there, but yeah, I mean, look, is some of the juice gone. It absolutely is because Joel will not be out there. Okay. Ah, humbug. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he ain't going to do anything. You, you feeling so. good about uh, Shake Milton and, and DeAnthony Melton uh, taking what, on Kevin Durant and the fellas? That, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if they, if Brooklyn doesn't just manhandle us, then they don't need to be on the same court with anybody. Uh, we have nobody there. Nobody. We. I mean, our, would you would you say that's our big three now? Our big three are gone. They're out of there. So, so. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's 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 crazy, Barrett. I think there's something going on at the Wells Fargo Center between the Sixers and the oh, Flyers. I players are just, water. Yeah, players are just dropping like flies. I hear Amy Fadul Kane just <laughs> just dropped like a sack of potatoes during a, an on camera report. You'd hate to see that happen. Barrett's but, playing hurt right now. And he spends yeah. a lot of time there. Hey, so, hey, you know. I'm like I had two wisdom teeth taken out, so I feel pretty dumb right uh, now, man. But uh, <laughs> if I if I were Danny Palmels, I'd be looking over my shoulder like, what's gonna bite me? You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Mike, I got to hit you with this one. Uh, Dombrowski uh, gets a three-year extension, which I don't think anybody's surprised considering his performance, but a guy who's his age, you never know that he wants to stick around that long. Plus, he had the interest in Nashville, getting a franchise, et cetera. Uh, your take on that and the Matt Gelb piece that Rob Thompson was going to step away. I don't know if you saw this. A- after this year, had had, he, had nothing changed. If he just stayed as the bench coach, he was going to retire. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. Uh, And in a sense, that doesn't surprise me just from kind of a macro view, Rob, because, you know, it's a little bit like riding a stationary bike. You've been doing it for so long and the view doesn't change. You know, why would I keep doing it? But the view changed when he became a manager. And I think Rob, based on some of the comments he's made uh, since the World Series, I think he liked it. And I think he realized he was pretty good at it his decision to take Zach Wheeler out of game six, notwithstanding. So, um, you know, good, good job by Matt to, to get that. And, and it really is an insightful piece. As far as Dombrowski goes, look, I think he feels like there's unfinished business here. You know, that this team that he helped put together, you know, finally got close to where everybody in that organization wanted it to go. Maybe there's a chance to go out and sign a truly great player and somebody like a Trey Turner or one of the other shortstops that are out there and put this team over the top and okay, I'll stick around for another three years to see if I can see this thing through. Hey Mike, I've been trying my best. I've been trying my best to stay optimistic about the flyers. You know, they get out to a great start. You know, um, and, and I'm telling people, hey, Tortorella's the man for the right man for the job to turn this thing around. Now they've lost like what? Seven in a row. 
is, is that have we seen the best of the Flyers and it's still early in the season? Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the, yes. The phrase I would use, Gunner, is regression to the mean. Uh, uh. this is the the Flyers are the t- are becoming the team that everybody knew they were going to be. They uh. are just they are outmanned. Man, that's just there's no other way to put it. They don't have uh. the top end talent to be able to compete on a nightly basis. And if you listen to Tortorella and what he's saying every, each and every day, yeah. it's, it's, you know, are we making the right plays? Do we know to make the right plays? Like not even looking at the outcome necessarily, because, you know, let's say a, a rookie makes the right move. He drops, he falls back into, you know, into a defensive position and the opposing skater just outmaneuvers and, and scores. You know, mm-hmm. Tortorella is looking at it and say, okay, well, were the kids' instincts right? And he's he's harping on those kind of fundamental things as opposed to, hey, are we competing for a playoff spot? He knows the score. Everybody in that organization knows the score or should know the score. And everybody following the team should know that this is this is not a playoff team. It just isn't. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Well said. Well said. Mike, keep up the it good hurts. work. Now, it what, hurts, Mike, man. It hurts. I know Gunner's Gunner's tearing up a little. He, he, oh Gunner's, man, I'm sorry. You gotta you gotta tell him the truth though. Yeah, rip it off like a band-aid, Mike. Exactly. Wow. When I, I obviously they can uh check you out on Twitter at Mike Sealski and inquire.com. Uh let's start with this. What's the next piece coming up? And then when can they catch you on the weekend on WIP? Well, I got a couple days off coming with Thanksgiving and all that. So I'm not writing again until Sunday. Good. I'll be back on uh IP with Glenn. Uh, this coming Saturday from uh, from 10 to 1. And awesome. if I can pump one thing, Rob, yeah, yeah, please. On, on Wednesday, December 7th, from 6.30 to 8.30, uh, Glenn is, is setting up an event at um, Puddler's Kitchen and Tap, sponsored by Conshock and Brewing Company in Bridgeport, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a holiday book extravaganza. I'm going to be there uh, selling copies of The Rise, my book about Kobe Bryant, Congrats. Zach Berman from the Zach Berman from the Athletic is going to be there selling copies of his book about the 2017 Eagles underdogs, and the great Ray Dittinger will be there as well nice. selling copies of his uh, memoir uh, and his collection of columns. Uh, I think you know the collection of columns is one last read. Right. I'm drawing a blank on his yeah, memoir. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm drawing a blank on the title of his memoir, but he'll be there. I think Charlie Manuel is going to be there. There's going to be. Uh, apparel and merchandise there nice. uh, from Shive Sports. It's going to be a really cool event. So if you're around on Wednesday, December 7th from 630 to 830, please be there. All right. Good stuff. Good, That's bro. a great lineup right great there. Group. Mike, yep. thanks as always, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, you. guys. Always okay, a pleasure. Take care, man. Buddy. Take care. Right. That is Mike Sealski. All right. When we come back, guys, um, I want to, Barrett, I want to pick it up where we we sort of left mm-hmm. off before we had Rob uh, Domofsky on uh, and just kind of your take on the game whether or not people have figured out the RPO, the Eagles offense, that's the the latest theory out there. We've moved on from blueprint to that. Um, We'll discuss that. And I also want to throw some of the, uh, some of the hall of fame um, uh, nominees, semifinalists that are out there because there's some pretty good Philadelphia ties. Okay. And and one of Barrett's former teammates, actually two that I just counted really quickly of Barrett's former teammates. So we'll do all of that when we get back. Don't go anywhere. We are Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network, D Gun, B Brooks, R Ellis. All right, I want to tell you about Pro Action Restoration. Pro Action Restoration is the place that you call or reach out to if your home or your business has experienced the pain and inconvenience of water, fire, smoke, or mold damage. It could be your property, it could be a house, it could be something you own. Uh, they're on call 24 hours, seven days a week. I know this because I called them on a Saturday morning and they got right out to my parents' house. Fixed the problem, diagnosed it, cleaned it up. The crew was professional, clean. The price was reasonable. All the boxes were checked, okay? They are licensed, bonded, fully insured, and they've been serving the tri-state area for more than two decades. ProAction will work in conjunction with your insurance company. Whether it's fire, whether it's water, whether it's smoke damage, mold remediation, you name it, they can handle it. Give them a call, 610-623-3760, 610 610- 623-3760 or online at proactionrestoration.com. That's proactionrestoration.com. Don't wait until after.